on that. Very good. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Ever since I was growing up uh, here in Brooklyn, New York, there's always been the tension between police and community. Uh, as you look around the country, most of the social unrest, if it's in the 60s with Watts, all the way to the 90s with South Central, has always been around police issues. I don't remember any major uprising or riot that happened around poverty or jobs. It's always around police. And I think it has been an, a, a prevalent issue in our community on whether the police are seen as friends or foe. I mean, needless to say, a lot of uh, my national reputation came from police cases that we fought and uh, trying to deal with the reformation of the police department. So I thought we would talk about our various views on policing because I think it's a prevalent issue even today. Nigel, you and I, disagree on most things, including what channel this is. <laughs> so uh, how do you weigh in on the whole question of police brutality, misconduct, criminality, whatever form uh, it may take? Well, I would make a uh, distinction between the relationship between the police and the African-American community before the civil rights revolution of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, as you know, my father and my boss, Roy, and as chairman of CORE, was a pioneer in trying to better police community relations, making sure that more blacks got in, on the force. There was a time that blacks were discriminated against all kind of ways and prevented from getting on the uh, police force. And then once on the force, making sure that the police have a proper perspective and proper relationship with the community. I believe that we've had a great deal of success. There are our aberrations, Diallo, Luima, I'm sure we'll bring many of them up uh, in today's discussion. But is that an aberration or a pattern? I would say it's an and, aberration. And, and including blacks on the force sometimes doesn't solve the problem. I mean, I, I don't prefer getting beat by black cops better than white cops. I, I prefer not getting beat at all. I agree. But the biggest threat to black folk in the black community is not a white, black, or green cop. It's crime. First of all, police brutality is a crime. I mean, to say that robberies are higher than rape doesn't make the rape feel better. I mean, I don't think the comparison is something I agree with. But, Mark, to tell, first of all, tell me about what you do. I'm, well, I'm retired from New York City Police Department. Right. I was uh, retired as a detective. For how long were you a detective? I, I was a detective for uh, about 16 years. What is your view of this whole question of policing? And uh, right. You've been inside the police Right, department. right, right. So what's interesting to me is that I know Nigel mentioned about some of the the advances that have been made as a result of CORE's work, and I would just say that there hasn't been enough advance, if any advance, uh, from pre-civil rights to this time, actually. I think uh, what's occurred in the police department is a result of some systemic and institutional problems. And I agree with you 100%. Brutality in the police department, not only in New York's police department, but across the country, it, it, it is not uh, more egregious because it's white, it's equally egregious if it is a black police officer as well, but it's systemic and institutional. Noted author, activist, par excellence, Kevin Powell yes, here. Thank you. Uh, with all of that, can still be victimized by the police. I mean, well, certainly. Um, I think if you're a black person in this country, especially a black male, no matter what your age, you can be victimized. It happened to me when I was 14 years old in my native uh, hometown of Jersey City. I got uh, beat down by a police officer. Um, I've seen it happen to many of my friends. And so, yeah, there certainly are some good police officers out there, but there are some who, I think, really abuse their power. You know, we see here in Brooklyn so many cases. Timothy Stansbury, just a couple of uh, short years ago, you know what I'm saying, um, uh, on a roof of a building, just happened to open the door and the officers just panicked and blew him away. And so this is very real. And so certainly there's been progress since the Civil Rights Movement, but the reality is you still have the danger if you're a black male, you step out on the street, especially a black or Latino male, where you may get shot by a police officer who's afraid of you just because you're a black male in this country. When Abner Lewima happened here in Brooklyn, man brought to the police precinct and raped and sodomized in the bathroom of the police department. This is not that long ago, just a few years ago right here in Brooklyn, right in the precinct I live in. And not one cop stopped him or turned him in. That's where I'm talking about the pattern. You can call it isolated. What wasn't isolated was all the policemen that was in the precinct that night, and none of them stopped him, 
None of them turned them in. And until we got the feds in, we had to march and almost turn the town upside down. Until we got the feds in, did any of the other police cooperate? And the cop that did it said that none of that happened. That in fact, the uh, damage done to Abner Lewima happened with a homosexual sex act he did. And after he seen his partners turn on him, he came in court and confessed. This is a pattern here. If a policeman is comfortable enough to go and take somebody to the precinct and sodomize it, he must know the cops are not going to stop him or turn him in. Actually, we might have a moment of agreement, all four of us, in that there were two problems there. One, the crime that was perpetrated against Abner Louima, and the fact that the police, his brother officers, did not put him in check, even before Abner Louima. Because I think history will show, his history will show that he probably demonstrated similar type of behavior even before that case. And what you have in the police department, what you have among a lot of professions, particularly close professions that have a fraternity, is you have a circle the wagons syndrome. You have it among doctors, you have it among lawyers, even occasionally among civil rights leaders where so people that are not necessarily guilty of misdoing will know that one of their brother colleagues is guilty of misdoing and instead of checking them, what they do is they have a knee-jerk reaction, we're all under attack. So they well, circle I, I the wagons. That's true. I check your father every chance I get. Now <laughs> <laughs> you are sick and tired of the police officers beating them up, cursing them out, arresting them for nothing. They're like an occupying force, a foreign occupying force in our community. They don't know our culture. There's hundreds of thousands of our youth are stopped just because they have hip hop gear on, because they're black, they're Latino, and they live in the hood, and they're being violated. Well, we need to bring back community patrols. Some young brothers and sisters, they patrol our communities, watching the police and watching our people. We need to have an independent agency that prosecutes police. When you murder us, you take your butt to jail, and you can read a big black history book while you're in jail for life. I think it's a racial power cake, an explosion can happen at any minute, but we'll take it into their own hands soon and we're going to have some problems out there.